This is the Run Pod Option. I'm Marty. We are missing Kyle and Jeff. Uh, we have a special interview lined up. You can follow us on Twitter at RunPodOption. You can email us, RunPodOption at gmail.com. And as always, we're brought to you by the Fifth Quarter Network, fifthquarter.net. We got Discord, we got forums, we got articles. And right now we have a guest, Mr. Kyle Johnson from at CSFL Hub on Twitter. Kyle, how's it going? Hey, what's going on? Thanks for having me, man. No, man, absolutely. It's a treat. Uh, you, you reached out to me and and... You, you taught me something immediately because the CSFL up until right now, and I'm going to make a guess for a lot of our listeners is something that they're not totally familiar with. So if you would, what is the CFS CSFL? Okay. So great, great starting question. So the CSFL is known as the Co- collegiate sprint football league. It is a league that has been around since 1934. So coming, you know, close up on almost a hundred years, a little under, yeah. um, and it is, it is a full contact football, 11 on 11 football, but, uh, there is a weight requirement. You are requ- required to weigh 178 or under two days prior to the game day. So if your game is on Friday, you weigh in Monday and Wednesday, if your game is on Saturday, you weigh in Tuesday and Thursday. That is the only restriction. Um, that is the only thing that could, quote unquote, inhibit you. Everything else is the NCAA regulation rules, rule book, uh, policies, all of that nature. OK, so still no brass knuckles are allowed or anything like that. It's just it's just simply you got to meet weight. Yep. That is the only uh, liken it to a wrestler. OK, no, that's, that's a pretty pretty great crossover point because I knew just about every wrestler in high school who wore trash bag suits. Let me ask you, Kyle, I know you're a former player and we'll get to that a little bit later, but did you ever have to wear trash bag suits to cut weight? Um, Unfortunately, well, I say not unfortunately, fortunately, no, not me. I'm about, you know, one coming out of high school. I was like five, seven, five, eight. I was probably only one seventy, like 74, 75. So I was already good. Actually, uh, something, I don't know if your research turned it up, but the weight limit was actually smaller just three years ago. The weight limit actually used to be 172. Um, yeah, and then it moved it to 178. And correct me if I'm wrong, but when it started, it was also only 150 back yes. in the 30s, yep. right? Yep. And typically what they look at, and one of the reasons I've been a big proponent of increasing it even further, or at least the 178 for the time being, is the the size of the, at the they base their weight and requirements off of the size of the average male through like demographics and, you know, census okay. The size of the average male has since, you know, increased because, you know, people immigrate to America and have built families here. So you have different, you know, genotypes and body types and, you know, uh, races, things like that. So the average builded male in 2020 is not the same as it was in 1920. So that's part of the reason they started to change and fluctuate, which I think has only helped the league. Yeah, I don't think I don't think I've I could <laughs> I don't think I've weighed 178 pounds since before I started playing football in high school mm-hmm. <laughs> because I was a big I was a big dude uh, playing defensive line. So mm-hmm. I, I uh, when I saw that I was like, okay, wow, all right, 178. Um, mm-hmm. Do you think kind of before we kind of move on from that with the weight? There's obviously not a height restriction, right? No, not whatsoever. I played against guys who were six foot five. Okay. Does it benefit the taller guys like that when you have largely people that are all similar or the same size? Like I know there's bigger bodies, you know, broader shoulders, things like Mm -hmm. that, but does does height make a huge impact? No, any more or less of an impact than it would in a regular football game in any D2, D3 or D1 game. You could be six foot four and not a talented football player. Right. I've seen football. Uh, I played with a kid named Rayvon Floyd Bennett, who's one of the best all-purpose players to ever grace the league. And he was only about five foot three. He was a he was a mid, you know, D three did D two recruit. He was just short, and that's the only thing coaches, you know, would continuously point out to him. And he was one of the most effective ball carriers and pass catchers the league's ever seen. But so that's that's awesome. To your original question, the height wouldn't benefit you any more. Then if, you know, I know quarterbacks who are 5'8", who play like Russell Wilson, and then 6'6", guys who play like Brock Eisweiler. 
Right. That, yeah, we all know Brock. So you know what? This is actually a perfect segue because I was going to mention this. Uh, a guy I played uh, ball with in high school, his name is Colin Beto. And he went to, I believe it's like Missouri Southwestern State. And this is a small diatribe here, but he was five, six, maybe five, seven. Mm-hmm. And he was a wide receiver. He went to the same college that Rod Smith did, former Denver Bronco. Mm-hmm. And he broke every Rod Smith receiving record because the dude had a two and a half foot vertical and mm-hmm. was fast and one of the grittiest people I've ever met. Like the dude mm-hmm. just hustled in, in the weight room, on the field, mm-hmm. everywhere. And it goes to kind of show what you, what you mentioned. If you yeah. can play ball, you can play ball flat out. Mm-hmm. And that's what the CSFS, uh, the CSFL is all about. Okay, so who who are some of the notable players that maybe we've heard of that have played in the CSFL? Okay, so I don't know how many of your listeners are fans of Navy, the program, you know, military, you know, institution, things like that. But uh, two what well, years is it? So we played him in 2016. So in 2016, an individual known as Brendan Clements actually uh, played okay. for the Navy Sprint football team. And he's one of the more interesting cases in the CSFSL because he was on the FBS team at Navy for three years. He was actually, uh, what was that, that the Freedom Conference, American Conference? Uh, uh, the American, Senate? American Athletic American, Conference. Yeah, he was in a, he was American Conference, I think, third or second team corner, um, which lets you know the level of talent and football player he was. He was one of the best defensive players in that conference in FBS football. Um, he ended up coming to Navy Sprint team for, you know, reasons personable to him. You know, I'm not going to delve into that. But uh, he came down to the CSFL's team and he balled out. He actually transitioned to running back because of how athletic he was. He did play some D-back for them as well. But um, he he scored 11 rushing touchdowns that year, which is top 10 for most in the season. Um, I forget the exact amount of rushing yards he had on the top of my head, but it was top notch. And Which is important, up, and not to interrupt, but it's mm-hmm. important to suggest how many games do you guys play in a season? So we play uh, seven games with the now instituted title game being the eighth game between okay, the winner yeah. of the North Division and South Division. Yeah, because 11 touchdowns, I was thinking, like, okay, if someone's just going to say, like, okay, 11, what's that? But, like, mm-hmm, yeah. over that short span. Okay, go ahead. Continue. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. But um, no, no, no. I'm, I'm glad to stop and answer any question. But um, he came down to the sprint team and, and balled out. And actually, because of his contributions to the sprint team, as well as his contributions to the FBS team, he was given uh, NFL opportunities. He worked out for the Packers and the Redskins, um, ultimately didn't land sticking with a team. But as any football player will tell you, all you want is your chance. Um, right. All you want is your shot. So uh, the exploits he distributed in the CSFL ended up helping him get a, you know, opportunity in the NFL. Um, So that's probably one of the biggest players to ever play in the league. Um, To allude to some of the athleticism that's in the league, uh, especially coming from Brendan, but I like to tell people about this because, you know, people here, like, oh, I see the shorter guys or not. Um, There are some top-notch athletes who have come across this league and who play in the league right now. There was a receiver up at St. Thomas Aquinas named Dante Brown. I believe he's a sophomore or a freshman. Didn't okay. do too much in the football field yet, but, you know, he's still young. There's still a young program. He's growing. But he actually was just named the ECC, which is, I believe, the Eastern Coast Conference Indoor Men's Track Athlete of the Year. Okay, um, he, wow. He ran the 60, the two long jump. His 60 meter was a 691. Um, I don't know how many people are familiar with track, but that's ungodfully fast. <laughs> and his uh, long jump, which won, you no, know, the entire – ECC was a 7.29 um, meters and his 200 was a 21.94. So he's a sub 22, Good 200 nice. guy. Any track guy knows that that, you know what I'm saying? And that's just one player in the league. Um, most of these teams, if not all of the good teams, a Chestnut Hill, a Mansfield, an Army, a Navy, um, a Penn, the crux of their team is built on phenomenal high school talents, guys who could play D3 to D2. And in some cases, like Brendan Clements and a few other places, even D1. So uh, when most people hear about it, they tend to think, oh, it's just a bunch of guys, you know, who out there just want to run around. When in fact, there are guys who attempt to do that and they often do not play and or quit. And I've seen it happen because they don't realize like, oh, wow, dang, that guy could have went to Westchester, which is a prominent, you know, Division three school in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Or that guy could have went to Bloomsburg. That guy was getting re- recruited by Shenandoah in Virginia. So these teams aren't just guys running around who want to relive. These are guys who are legitimate college football players who could have 
but for whatever reason, chose the school that they chose. The same reason anyone chooses the school that they choose. You know what I mean? So no, the I level of athlete absolutely. is top notch. Yeah, it, it just watching the highlights and and anybody I, I I do suggest there's plenty of game tape that's on YouTube right now, and even if it's just three or four minute highlight packages of certain games. It's really interesting to watch because it's just, it just looks like normal football. It's not like it's, you know, anything yeah. crazy. No it's not the whatsoever. XFL, right? It's, yeah. it's, 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 uh, it's pretty fantastic. And mm-hmm. to build to your point, I think coming from Dallas, Texas, right. And coming from the South, which as we discussed before the interview, this is a very Northeastern region sport. Mm-hmm. there's a ton of guys that I played with that quit football in high school because mm-hmm. they knew they didn't have the D1 or D2 or D3 body, despite them being fantastic players. Mm-hmm. Having a center, for instance, that's 5'10 and short-armed, but he was an absolute baller, mm-hmm. but he quit football as a junior because there's really not an alternative, at least for us then, Mm-hmm. not knowing about the CSFL, it really gives a chance where a lot of people love college football because it doesn't have the the superstar and bigger than the show or bigger than the sport personalities necessarily. It's kind of keeping that amateur vibe going, if that makes sense. Yep, I know exactly what you mean. The CSFL seems to not only have that vibe, but to weaponize it into a very, very cool product on the field because you get to see guys, and hopefully with with its potential growth, get to see guys that are all county or all district in southwest Texas or northern California or wherever that Mm -hmm. otherwise aren't going to get recruited. Mm-hmm. And have a chance to play football on a still big stage. Mm-hmm. Yep, uh, a lot of these, you know, obviously you could go through every roster, every team for generations, but um, typically, you know, coaches will go, you know, cast out their recruiting net. So uh, off the top of my head, I know St. Thomas Aquinas has a young man from Florida, Ernest Stallworth, who proved to be one of the best receivers in the league in his first year. So that's a Florida guy. Um, like we mentioned before the podcast, Outerson Brodus, uh, the newest team, is in West Virginia. So uh, they have their hands, you know, like West Virginia, obviously Virginia, when a lot of the northern teams like Army or Cornell probably don't. Um, so the the recruiting net is out there with all of these coaches. Um, I've ta- I talked to most of the coaches, not all of them. They are always actively recruiting. So, you know, anyone you are in touch with from your old high school or any of the little generation right under us um, looking to play college football, if you're good enough, these coaches will find you. It um, doesn't hurt to reach out to them. You know, they have the recruiting questionnaires on the sites, just like every team does in the nation. They have, you know, their coaching contacts. Each coach has their recruiting area. So you're any player looking to get recruited, it's possible. You just got to have the tape and you got to have the character. OK, so let's let's put that right into our next question here. So kind of a two-parter because I imagine it's going to come back to your playing days and maybe how you got recruited or found your team, but how did your coverage of the sport begin or your interest really? You can hit both of those if you'd like. Okay. So my coverage of the sport, my first wanting to cover the sport probably came my senior year. Um, Like you mentioned earlier, I'm a former player. I played at Chestnut Hill college from 2015 to 2018. I started defensive end and Will Backer. Um, four-year starter, numerous stats, numerous records, what have you. Um, but my senior year, or maybe right after my senior year, I had always been chirping at my coach, just, you know, chatting, watching film in his room. I'm like, yo, there's no coverage. Like, there's an official league website. It's very bland. It's just, you know, white coloring, up-to-date, you know, articles, just reviews of each week. But you could tell whoever writes them doesn't watch them. They kind of just look at the box score, that type right. of thing. Like it's someone's duty to do it. Not like they want to do it. Um, and I, that always bugged me. I'm like, yo, there's, you know, so many talented football players in this league. Like I just mentioned to you, uh, Brendan Clements, um, army has had their fair share of D one bounce back guys. Navy's had a couple other ones. Um, you know, we've had some high level guys at chestnut Hill that I can mention in a minute, but I was always like, yo, there's, so much the league is dripping with talent um impeccable young athletes and great institutions there should be more of a 
not even necessarily fan affair for a monetary value, but just more attention shed on to the league. Because much like yourself, when I first got recruited, I didn't know anything about it until my then coach at the con- time, Mike Pearson, came, you know, to recruit me. So I talked to my coach and he told me he liked all the ideas and everything. So I just started off, you know, on my own. You know, it's not too hard to set up a WordPress website. It's not too hard to set up a second Instagram, you know, as opposed to your real Instagram. It's not that whole just start right. up a Twitter Um to the, I thought it would be a lot harder to dive into the podcasting world, but once I got all the necessary materials and I had someone kind of give me some direction, I just started with that. So as soon as I finished, um, you know, my senior year, obviously that spring, uh, I, I typically ran track for three years, but that last year I, I didn't want to run track, to be honest with you, because there was no more football. <laughs> yeah. but, um, I just started preparing myself for that summer. I'm like, all right, these are going to be the layouts of my podcast. Here's where I'm going to podcast. This is the app I'm going to use. Here's some of the content I'm going to write. I would bounce ideas off, you know, the guys younger than me who were going to be incoming seniors. I'm like, yo, this is your team now. You know, treat me as a non-player. You know, what are some things would you would like to see? Treat me as strictly a reporter type. And, you know, they were, you know, podcasts would be cool, Kyle, blah, blah, blah. Or like uh, player interviews, which I did implement before and after the games. Um, so that's probably when everything started for me. After my senior year, I just uh, dedicated myself to to – getting the word out there about the CSFL, um, highlighting the players, and um, just promoting the great league that we all uh, love and play in. Kyle, sincerely, it is, it is so incredibly cool what you're doing with the CSFL in general because not only is it something that you wanted, but you're acting on it, and you potentially have a chance to – shed a spotlight on an entire division. That's why I wanted to have you on too. Like it's, it's just, it's, it's extremely, extremely cool. So thank you. Uh, mad props there. Thanks. Thanks buddy. So you kind of talked about which teams um, and, and some of your coaches. So let's, let's kind of hit that. Who are some, I guess we kind of covered the players. So let's skip that. Are there any coaches or anything just on the field from maybe a style of play that? the CSFL has either been on the forefront of or that have adapted that's really changed the league as a whole. Something like, for instance, the run and shoot, the air raid, et cetera. I know it's a fast league in general, but when I saw an Army Navy game and I saw them throwing the ball 10 or 15 times, it was it was kind of weird knowing that they were in the triple option mm-hmm. at the D1 level. Mm-hmm. Um, well, you start so particularly with Army, Navy, Penn, or Cornell, the teams that also have a Division One team. Uh, Cornell, not so much. Penn, not so much, because all those guys are, you know, what we consider "quote unquote" smart. Um, all the coaches <laughs> are, but Arm they employ their own systems as opposed to the D one teams, which I'm getting at. Army, as you saw yourself, does the same, but Navy most mirrors their FBS, you know, or Ivy League counterpart. Navy runs pretty much the same offense a little less triple option specifically um you know with two backs in the backfield or a back in the h-back but navy runs pretty much identically the same you know play schemes and the interesting thing about navy um while i bring them up inside the navy uh, athletic community the the csfl coaching job at navy is one of the most sought after jobs in the ranks of the entire navy That job is the only job in the CSFL that actually changes frequently because that job rotates every three years. There's only a head coach of the Navy sprint football team every three years. There's a new coach and you have to petition and you have to have accolade and integrity and, you know, a claim to your name at Navy to even be considered for that job. So the coach, the head coaches you see at Navy are some of the most impactful, you know, well-produced, you know, well-acclaimed men that the Naval, Naval Academy has to offer, just a head, just a coach. So that lets you know the level of, you know, expectation they have for their player. Um, Are they typically would, bringing guys in from the D1 side, like, a say, a linebacker's coach or a defensive, coord- uh, defensive coordinator, a grad assistant, someone like that, and filling back? Or is it generally someone that's climbing the ranks that's a former Naval officer maybe and that's trying to make that shot? In terms of the head coach, it's usually a naval officer, Um, not necessarily someone who's been established, you know, as the running backs coach here or the film tape, you know, coach there. It's usually just a naval officer who is interested in the position. They usually have some football background, like the head coach right now is a great man named David Williams, 
who is actually one of the best running backs that sprint football has ever seen. So he had the connection to the league, obviously. He's a former MVP, you know, over a thousand yard rusher. Um, you know, I think he's in the 20 touchdown club, which only a handful of players have ever scored 20 touchdowns combined. So in a season them, in or a season. in no, okay. in a car- career, career. Okay. Gotcha. Career. Yeah. The 20 touchdown club is a club. That was a trend I noticed in the league as I was, you know, culminating my career stats and whatnot was that, dang, there's not a lot of guys that have scored 20 touchdowns. So, um, if you're in the stats and trends and whatnot, like I am, you notice something like that and you grab onto it. So I created this 20 touchdown club. Um, not necessarily I created it, but I shed light on it that, hey, there's only 15 guys in the entire, you know, 86 year history of the league that have scored at least 20 combined touchdowns, you know, rushing, receiving, returning, things like that. But um, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. But for your as to your original question with the coaching, um, that's probably the most specific coaching thing in the entire league is the Navy job. Um, outside of that, in terms of scheme, um, there's probably one thing that is. I want to say not revolutionized, but was always a big thing in the league is what you see now in FBS and NFL football with this hybrid defensive back who's more of a backer and a DB. That has always been a thing in the league for about the last decade or two. And some of the most impactful defensive players have played that, you know, typical in our defense, it was called the Joker, or like the Joker position that, you know, that hybrid safety. Backer. Yeah, it's, a, it's that third safety that's floating. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. in the box, which would would and I, Isaiah Simmons for Clemson, you know, has famously done to improve his draft. Style. Nice. That's um, a, that's exactly the person I was going to suggest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that position. If you are good at it, you will flourish in the league. One of my old teammates, uh, Kadeem Panky, he actually transferred in from IUP. He was an IUP player. Um, okay. Ended up leaving there. You know, IUP is one of the strongest football programs in the nation. They put guys in the NFL. Um, he transferred from IUP. Uh, to come to Chestnut Hill um, just because, you know, he liked the coaches, he liked the team and everything. So he transferred in and he was our joker. Like we just, you know, talked about that position and he currently plays overseas professionally in Germany right now. Um, So his talent level here in the CSFL took him the professional route, but that, you know, hybrid joker position is something that the league has always had, but you see now in other different levels of football, it's starting to become popularized. So kind of discussing hybrid positions, are there, many or any players in the league that play both sides of the ball? Uh, Routinely throughout history, yes. Uh, Some do because of necessity. Uh, Any random year, you know, whether it be injury or just total talent level on the team or lack thereof. Some because they are just that phenomenally talented where they will be the best receiver and the best DB. So, you know, you have no choice but to, you know, let that guy's talents flourish. Uh, Witt Shaw for Penn comes to mind. He actually is the league a uh, leader in yards, touchdowns, and catches. So he has the triple crown, the Jerry <laughs> Rice crown, if you will, no in doubt. CSFL history. He was also, I believe, a three-time first league selection at safety. Um, wow. a, a Will Griffin for Cornell, who just graduated, who was their entire offense last year before he unfortunately got hurt and the year prior, uh, one of their most explosive playmakers of the last decade. He was their best DB, and he played safety. Um there has been a couple of different guys. You know, Mansfield has a guy, Chase Moser, who's their stud D tackle. He took some carries at goal line fullback for them this year because of his ability to hit the hole and hit the hole hard. So you will see it from time to time, much like Division Three to FBS. It's not necessarily frowned upon, but because of dur- durability concerns, you really don't want your best player, you know, taking that many hits. Right. So it's not typically employed the same way it is in any other level of football, but you will see it from time to time, either through injury, concern or necessity, or just, you know, talent, total talent on the team. So is there a, a roster size limit? And, and I guess, are there, is it a proper athletic scholarship like any other? So the roster limit is 65, I believe. Uh, Army and Navy uh, typically uh, always have cuts uh, because of how many guys try and come. Um, they typically start out both those academies with 100 guys, and they whittle that down to 65. Um, some of the D- traditional D2 teams like Chestnut Hill and Mansfield, um, like, I, like we said prior, if you're not going to cut it, you're not going to play. So while they might let you know a Joe Schmo come out there, don't expect him to get into the game type of thing. You know what I mean? Right. They'll, they'll give you a jersey and give you a helmet. But if you're not a good football player. You know, mom and dad are just going to see you stand here for two and a half hours. <laughs> right. Just because you wanted to say you played. 
when in all actuality, you're not a good football player, so you won't play type of thing. Um, and in terms of the scholarship, nobody receives an athletic scholarship, but the school's typical, you know, grant money or whatever your school's academic award is can fluctuate depending on certain variables deemed by your coach. So okay. coaches can help you out is the question is a better way to while not might not be a full athletic scholarship. A coach can still help you out. That's pretty awesome, though. And, and I think. I think I saw, and I don't know if this is for every single program because I know some programs are a lot newer, but I saw where fundraising efforts for those type of programs sometimes are alumni games where it's current roster against mm-hmm. a graduated roster. Mm-hmm. And the gra- it, for instance, you would pay in potentially for mm-hmm. a Chestnut Hill alumni game and still play at you know, 23, 24, 25 years old for that game, but it's all in an effort to raise money. Is that something that's practiced largely across the league or just a couple of schools? Uh, right now, just a couple of schools. The schools you see employ that are typically Cornell and Penn. Um, Army does a game, but it's typically, you know, spread out over half decades, you know, to get more, you know, guys to come back because it's not an every year thing. Right. Um, but Penn and Cornell do it every year. And typically, the method they employ is, like you said, uh, you know, alum come back. And to keep the tradition of the CSFL alive, typically an alum, every pound they are overweight is like, you know, 10 or a dollar they pay. So if I'm coming back to play and I'm an even 200 now, you know, I'd have to pay, you know, the $22 or whatever the figure would be to play. And that's, you know, obviously as an alum, I can give whatever I want, but that would just be like the base contribution. Right. Whereas if a guy is 179, he's the one pound over, he'd just pay, you know, the dollar, but obviously no alum's just going to pay a dollar. All right. So tell me, <laughs> tell me, you show up tomorrow, you got $20. Are you taking, are you still sacking people? You still got it, dude? Oh yeah. Uh, I actually <laughs> am a uh, coach now. I coach my uh, youth team, my one, one forty five and unders, uh, they're typically 13 to 14. I coach a team called the Harleysville Eagles out in Harleysville, Pennsylvania. Nice. We actually won our entire league last year, and we went to the NFL of Spain uh, and won our whole division in their national tournament. And we played our last game on national television. And I currently, on top of coaching them, I also train athletes from Division One to basically Pop Warner. So I'm still very much involved in football uh, training specifically, uh, particularly like I told you, I, w- I was an edge guy. So I'm, you know, I'm really specialized in outside backers, Wills and Sams and, you know, stand up DNs, three techs, five techs, yep. you know, things like that. So I could, you know, I, I don't I'm not one of those coaches who just stands there and tells you what to do. I'm going to put my hands on you and I'm going to show you what I'm doing works. So, yeah, I could I tell them all the time, like guys are still chat with. I could go get 10 sacks in the season right now. Get out there, just drag him, dude. So, <laughs> to, so Chestnut Hill, 2015 was their inaugural season in the CSFL. Is that correct? Yep, yep. That was my so, first year with the program. All right. So, correct me if I'm wrong, and if I read something incorrectly here, but did you record the first sack in Chestnut Hill college history? Yes, yes, I did. Get out of, of here, proud, man! That is, dude, that is the coolest. My, yep, one of my proudest moments. That was against Princeton. That was their very first game. We had a packed crowd. Um, I remember, you know, that whole week of practice uh, was actually an adjustment for me because I was actually recruited to Chestnut Hill to play wide receiver. I was a wide receiver in high school at a, a pretty dominant run heavy team. We had this stud running back, my homie, Samir Bullock. He, he went on to having a fantastic career at IUP, but uh, he was a 2000 yard rusher. So Goodness. we were passing the ball 10 times a game. If yeah. Even. So I'm getting two passes my way. Say one's good coverage. I'm getting like one catch a game just because of the philosophy we have so i made my bread and butter just you know rocking dudes i'd come in at h back you know motion across the formation as an extra tight end lead block for him so i made my money in my high school tape just you know ringing dudes helmets and yep. you know that brought mike <laughs> pearson to our games who was the head coach just Hill at the time he talked to my coach at the time in high school frank mcgardo who now coaches a father judge at prestigious school in philadelphia um and my coach coach frank came up to me he's like yo man you know some other schools looking at you, but you know, you ever heard of sprint football? And I was like, I was like, you, I was like, no. And then I met coach Pearson. He told me all about it. Let me know what was going on. Um, ended up making the best decision for me and my family went to Chestnut Hill and probably about the second week of practice, we were doing a wide receiver blocking gauntlet, just, you know, dogs in the pit, you block him and you block him. Somebody go to the ground type of thing. And I had beaten everybody 
in the receiving core until I got to Kadeem, the as for mentioned teammate I had who came from IUP. Yeah. And Kadeem, Kadeem is like six foot two and he's every chiseled, you know, at the time. Cause you know, you only have to weigh in during the season. So he wasn't 170. So he was a every chiseled, you know, 185, 188. And I ended up losing that drill to him. But Mike Pearson, the head coach was watching that while we were doing that. He was like, look, you're the you're the you're our fourth guy in our you know spread package. You could stay the fourth guy in the spread page, package and keep working your ass off all year. You know who knows what'll happen, or you could come start you know DN outside backer right now, and you could be getting these first team reps right now during this next you know period in practice. And I coach say no more, and I never looked yeah, back. Done. And that now I got you know I'm third in my school's history in tackles with 130. Um, I have the second most tackles for loss in my school's history. I'm the all-time sack leader. Um, I'm one of only five players in league history with over 100 tackles, 30 tackles for loss, and 15 sacks. Um, I'm top 10 all-time in tackles for loss in league history. I'm top 10 in sacks all-time in league's history. So, you know, I'm a two-time all-league guy. So I think I made the right decision. Um, no doubt. I believe so. I mean, we, <laughs> that's a laundry list of accolades. I'd say, yeah. I'd say you did all right by yourself. Yeah, so a lot of a lot of work and nervousness went into that first sack that me freaking out about the first sack might not show after I got it. But um that sack right there led to, you know, four years of just phenomenal play. Uh, my blood, sweat, and tears on the field. That's awesome, man. And so so kind of speaking about Chestnut Hill and them being a newer program, Navy and Army are the most decorated programs from from a championship standpoint. And Penn are the only charter members left of the CSFL. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Okay. So of some of these newer schools, your Mansfield, St. Thomas Aquinas, Post University, Chestnut Hill, Caldwell, and the most recent Alderson Broadus, what school do you think might be the next standard bearer for CSFL who are going to challenge the navies and the armies of the world? Hmm. Well, if there's going to be one team, uh, it might be a little up in the air, right? Now. Just like every program goes through, we go on four year cycles. So some teams hit their peak and then, you know, have to reload. And that might take, you know, another generation or two to get a, a group of guys like that. Right. Um, at Chestnut Hill, the last three uh, seasons, we had winning seasons. My last two years in the league, we were four and three. Last year, Chestnut Hill went five and two, I believe, which was their best record ever. So they're definitely up there. Mansfield has had uh, two back-to-back or three back-to-back winning seasons as well. Uh, typically, what you see with the league, and I can speak on this uh, very, very well, uh, with the new teams, usually you see a turnover in the program year three and year four. Uh, that's what it was for us at Chestnut Hill. First two years, you know, you're playing, developing your good players, and, you know, you're getting your licks. You know, those first two years, you know, we were getting, you know, we were getting our asses handed to us sometimes. You know what I mean? Um, but then year three, we took a real turn. And then year four, we took a bigger turn. And you see last year, they took the biggest turn, the best record in program history. Same thing for Mansfield. Um, while it's not their third year in the league, this is their third year under this regime, meaning this coach, Coach Evans. Year three of, of his regime, turnaround, um, you know, breakthrough. Uh, so St. Thomas Aquinas is going into year three next year. Uh, Caldwell, who broke through last year, while the wins might not have been there, the competition was there. Um, they're going into year four this year. They're looking like they're going to have a breakthrough. Um, Alderson Brodus had some success year one. Um, despite their record, that was the best first year team I've ever seen, including my 2015 team, seeing the Stack first year team and seeing the Caldwell first year team. That Alderson Brodus team this past season was the best new addition in the league. So if they've already set that precedent, the sky might be the limit for them. Uh, they have a real, real phenomenal coach, Coach uh, Jarrett, I believe, who is a multi-time, you know, West Virginia, like high school state champion. So they hired him because of his acclaim. Yeah. No, so, yeah. And, and, and the recruiting pipelines there immediately. Immediately, because, you know, that's, you know, that's a primetime state to be getting your guys from. Those guys are country strong. Um, <laughs> but um one team, I don't, I don't think there's going to be one team. Obviously, there's going to be one team to finally break through and do it. But what is much more enlightening is you see the level of competition. Uh, Navy, uh, who won the South Division last year, which I believe is the tougher division currently, the way it's constructed, the way it's set up. The South Division is 
miles ahead of the North Division, in my you know professional opinion. Um, Navy was in a dogfight every game last year. Dogfight. Almost they gave Chestnut Hill gave them a run for their money at, at home in Philadelphia. Penn Navy didn't score a touchdown. They scored three field goals. Uh, you know, have a phenomenal kicker. He uh he was an all league kicker. He just actually made my all decade team. So they don't win that game without that kicker. Um, then they played Caldwell at Caldwell in the jungle, and that was a dog fight. So you see the level of competition is there. All it's going to take, you know, you know what goes into a game is one play here, one play there. You know, it's kind of right. hard to predict the future on that. But the precedent has been set where some years passed in the league, it was much run through, just Army run through, Navy run through, what's up, we'll see you at the end type of thing. Um, there had been, you know, phenomenon where, you know, Penn's blown up and Cornell's actually won in the last two decades. They won in 2006, I believe. So as long the, the competition level across the board is, is this, this is the most parity the league's ever seen. Um, it's not just, yeah, let's just lace up, you know, and beat up these Ivy League kids. You know, these Ivy League <laughs> kids, these Ivy League kids punch back. Um, Penn is actually just ended what I would call a quarterback renaissance. They had the best quarterback in the lead for almost a decade. They went from a Todd Bolser, who's a top five quarterback easily, to a Mike McCurdy, who is the best quarterback the league's ever seen. I've never seen anyone in this league throw a football the way he could throw a football. He should have been on the Division One team. And then they just had Eddie Jenkins graduate, who's the most prolific rushing quarterback. The league. He's the only quarterback to have over 25 passing touchdowns in his career and 25 rushing touchdowns. Um, wow. So that's 50 touchdowns, just him. Um, and he just graduated. So Penn is actually in one of the biggest predicaments in the league, which, you know, um, I don't have to go into right now because they need it. But um, in terms of your original question, I'm not sure if there's a single team right now, but the parity is there to where all it takes is one day. You know, it's, you know, obviously we play on Fridays and Saturdays, but it's an even Sunday. All it takes is the right group of guys, one weekend, right game plan, good coaching. Giants go down. So are most of these games televised or streamed on a particular site, or is it something you kind of have to see in person? Um, so there's no individual site dedicated to just sprint football, which is something I want to change eventually. Typically, what you're going to have to do if you want to watch the game, you go to your team, your team's you know, college site. So Mansfield, they stream all their games. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, they have a great, great game production. They stream all their games. Mansfield, Mansfield actually has the best game day production of any of the teams. In- they have great broadcasters, uh, their marketing, their, their animations, you know, and all the little videos, for break for commercial, things like that. Alderson Brodus has a really good broadcasting, you know, marketing team that is at the game. So you would just go to say, you know, Mansfield, you know, athletics, sprint football, go to the games, you know, where the schedule is, and it'll say that there's a live video next to it. That means it's streamable. Um, Chestnut Hill also streams games from time to time. Um, I believe all the teams do. Typically with the Ivy Leagues, um, they have a partnership with ESPN. So typically Penn and Cornell games are played on ESPN, um, which is the the app like yep. service for ESPN. So you can catch a game on ESPN+. Plus. We played Penn the year... I was at Chestnut Hill. We beat Penn. We were on ESPN+. Plus. Um, every Blue Moon, you'll catch a game on ESPN3, actually, too, um, which is really, really nice. Uh, they should start doing that more. Um, but, yeah, nine times out of ten, you want to catch a game. You just follow the, you know, the team's Twitter page or their athletic page. And most of their games, if not all of their home games, are live streamed for each team. Awesome. That's really cool because that's something I absolutely want to check out this season. And, mm-hmm. and as far as when – the regular season begins and ends. Mm-hmm. When is it that CSFL is playing? Uh, so we start typically September. Um, Cause you know, that's right around when college is starting. So, you know, typically guys get there maybe a week before a week and a half before, you know, normal classes would start, you know, get the practice and get the work in. And, you know, usually September 9th around or 7th, you know, whatever that Friday or Saturday falls under. Um, all of September, all of October, maybe the last game in November, and then it's the And the championship's new, you said earlier, right? It's only been around for a couple of years? Yeah, I believe this will be the third year of the championship game. The first year was 20, must have been 2017 or 2018. It was at the first year was at St. Aquinas. 
The second year, which was last year, was at no, this is only the third year. First year was at St. Thomas Aquinas in 2018. Last year it was at Penn, uh, you know, Franklin Field, the historic Franklin Field, which is a phenomenal place to play um, or run track if you've ever been to the Penn Relays. And then this year it's going to be at Mansfield. So it's a, it's a pitch similar to like an Olympic hosting pitch, you know, these teams make because the whole, you got to think about how many people come. These games do have really good turnouts. Um, I'm actually anticipating this, this championship game in Mansfield to have probably the biggest turnout in CSFL history because Mansfield it has a really, really strong fan, school, and alumni love. They typically lead the league in attendance every year up there next to And Army usually only leads because Army is inside of West Point. So the people who are there, like, live there, basically. Right. Um, yeah, it's, it's a short walk. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Whereas Mansfield, that's, you know, upper mountains, you know, old wood, you know, remnants of coal areas in America. Um, they typically turn, you know, they end the, end the season with thousands in the team. So this championship game there, whether Mansfield is in it or um, just because of the love of the sport and just the game of football in general, this championship game this year, whatever two teams do make it, is going to be probably the biggest crowd either team sees all year if it's not Mansfield themselves. So uh, I got one more question, and then we'll kind of wrap up. What do you think is the avenue for the CSFL to expand its reach across the country? Because you had mentioned that Alderson Broadus is that furthest west and the furthest south schools. And that being in West Virginia, there's obviously a lot of ground to cover here. Is there something that the CSFL is doing to grow, or are they pretty content and if they are content, where do you come in in terms of trying to do what avenues are you taking to grow the exposure and potentially set off a chain of events that could grow the sport from more program standpoints? Mm-hmm. Um, well, recently, the CSFL just elected a new commissioner, a man named Dan Mara. Uh, he's been involved in the CAC conference, the CACC you know, with numerous sports for almost a decade now. So he's, you know, he's a lot of pedigree to his name. So hopefully, you know, he has some ideas and he can bring things to the table that might differ. Um, before Dan, I will say the league very appeared to be very, very complacent. Uh, the way things were, you know, was good and dandy for them. The same way you had to fight for certain changes in the league. Um, typically, they were against, uh, you know, former commissioners. Um, come from certain backgrounds of a certain age, you know what I'm saying? Not to point out any specific thing, but they were very, yeah. very content. You know, things are just fine and dandy the way they are. And it is what it is type of deal. So Dan doesn't strike me as that type of man. So I'm actually going to be looking forward to speak to him whenever I can speak to him. I'll probably run into him at a game or two. Um, so they haven't inst- instituted anything yet. Although I will say the very first day Dan was hired, I saw more activity from the Twitter. The Twitter page basically, their Twitter page basically tweeted out the end of the week results, and that was it. And then the all league teams at the end of the year, and nothing until September. Dan's been there for about a couple of days now, and I've already noticed the increase in activity. So he clearly has a better sense for at least just social media pre- presence, if anything. Um, so I expect a lot of good things. Uh, I like the I like the leadership and the direction Dan's going to be taking the league. Um, as far as myself. Um, that's essentially why I started CSFL Hub. Um, as you know, the podcast, the Twitter, the Instagram, the website, I want to push the league forward, but also I want to be the number one stop shop for anything you want to know. Um, on the league, I have, I mean, on the website, I have a section for recruits where I have a link to every questionnaire that every team had available. So, you know, if you did have trouble reaching out, uh, to coaches or you couldn't find the staff directory, I have the questionnaire for every single team right there and there. Um, I have career season and game stats. Um, So, you know, players as a former player, you know, you love to see what those before you did and the excellence others achieved. So, you know, if I'm a running back and I see the season record for touchdowns is 10 word, I want 11, you know what I mean? So like it can add that drive because players see something. It's real. Um, The league didn't have anything like that. They just did the stats season by season. and had no cumulative, you know, anything. So I put that together for coaches and players to look at. Um, the, you know, the posts week to week, the interviews. So I just want to do whatever I can to push the league forward. I do a top, you know, top 10 plays every week and you know, bi-weekly. Um, 
you know, I have insightful videos highlighting certain players, certain teams, things like that. So my goal is to just push the league forward. Um, hopefully one day you can see something, you know, break through. Like, like I said, the Ivies already have it, ESPN and ESPN3. You know, maybe one day sprint football is in the future for that. Um, I, I talk to players and coaches probably as much as I talk to my friends. Um, my DMs <laughs> are always wide open, current players, former players. Um, because of the pedigree I have, I have a lot of defensive guys asking me, you know, to coach them up over the phone. I actually um, had a guy, I won't say his name, but he reached out to me and he just really, I, I was a senior when he was a freshman. So he reached out to me and he's like, bro, you demolished my team. Like my very first year in the league, like, how did you get to the way you were? We actually watched film on FaceTime together and we watched That's this tough. whole season and I would just critiqued him because like I said, I train athletes. So. I train an athlete from Pop Warner to D1. It doesn't matter. But he knew I knew what I was talking about, particularly, you know, with sprint football. So, you know, I'm giving him tricks of the trade here and there. Here's what if you have attack, who likes to, you know, set far back. Here's how you want to attack his chest, things like that. Um, so me personally, I'm what you, I guess you would call an ambassador technically um, in terms of running the league and everything, you know, the CSFL hub and everything like that. So. I just want to do my part, you know, to put the league on the map, let it be known that there are some phenomenal players in this league. Uh, I know I mentioned Brendan Clements a- earlier, but just off the top of my head, and I mentioned Dante Brown, like I said, my teammate Kadeem Panky played at IUP. My old teammate Ricky Robinson, he plays professionally in Germany now. Uh, Penn had a defensive lineman, Angelo Mayos. He was from Penn's D1 team, came down to sprint. Brandon Coleman, who was a quarterback, came down to Navy. Uh, Craig Hamilton for Army came team jc watson um nick dearding a quarterback for navy ran track for the navy track team and he was second team all patriot league in the high jump um i just wanted to be known the level of athlete is that's in this league because a lot of naysayers or people foreign to it like uh, originally like oh you know like we said earlier oh those are just guys running when in all actuality these are better athletes than 90% of the people walking on the street. You might weigh 178, but that doesn't mean you could play. I think if I had to suggest, I'd be getting into the Olympics here about having football worldwide. And how do you balance it out so that America just doesn't run away with it? Maybe this is your way in. And you oh, become wow. the uh, you become the yeah. CSFL or the sprint the Olympic sprint football ambassador, dude. That would be crazy, and that would be great to level it out, like you said, because you know just ge- geographically and genetically, some countries aren't as predisposed to girth and size. You know, right, like- and and, <laughs> and Japan's been playing college football for a long time. Like mm-hmm. there's there's a lot of countries that are playing pro and collegiate level football still. Mm-hmm. That uh, yeah. that might be. You might have just been on to something. Hey, hey, (laughs) All right. So before we get out of here, uh, Kyle, drop everything, uh, every link, every Twitter you might need, uh, and we'll get out of here. And we will definitely have you back, if not um, before the CSFL season kicks off. We know with uh, the current situation the world is in, we don't know where that's at, but Mm -hmm. uh, maybe ahead of or after the national champion or national championship, I guess the championship game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect. and, and have you back on. So go ahead and drop those links and we'll get you out of here. Yeah, sure. Perfect. So the website currently as a setup is sprintfootball.game.blog. That is my WordPress site. That's where I put out all the articles. I have all the career stats, interesting things. Um, like I mentioned earlier, the recruiting questionnaires, uh, just thing, general things, general knowledge about sprint football. The Twitter page is CSFL Hub. Just CSFL Hub, all one word. And the Instagram is CSFL underscore Hub. And the podcast is the CSFL Hub Podcast. I am on Spotify, Anchor. I think the other one is Snatcher, uh, Apple Podcast. Anywhere podcasts are available, CSFL Hub Podcast is available. Yep. And if you have problems finding that on that website, there is a link to the podcast, whether you have Apple or Anchor. Or Spotify mm-hmm. too, I believe. Yep, on the Twitter page, if you find me on Twitter, CSFL Hub at CSFL Hub, I have a link to the website right in the bio as well as the podcast. Awesome, Kyle. I sincerely thank you for coming by. Uh, I appreciate it, and 
I'm glad I never had to play against you in football because it sounds like <laughs> it sounds like you had, you had the business, dude. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm so glad you responded when I reached out. Um, I listen to your guys' podcast. You guys do great over here. Um, I'll be more than happy to come back. And um, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Kyle. All right. Thanks, man. Hi, my name is Joshua Tracy. And I am Corwin Heller. And we are the hosts of a statistics and sports podcast called Juicing the Numbers. We cover the NFL, college football, MLB, and the NHL with anything that we like to talk about in between. If you like sports and the numbers behind it, come check out our show, Juicing the Numbers, on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you find podcasts. Hit us up on Twitter at JuicingPOD.